Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this event. Uh, we will wait just a few minutes for the people to join the webinar and then we will start. Okay, so I think we can start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second uh, meeting event of the uh, Concrete Affairs webinar series about uh, unreinforced beam column joints, under seismic uh, loading. So this uh, event is organized by the FIB Young Italy Young Members Group. I am Marta Del Zotto, a postdoctoral research fellow at University of Naples Federico II in Italy. I'm also the chair of the FIB uh, Young Members Group in Italy and also a member of the, the board of the uh, Young Members Group International. And just for who uh, doesn't know about us, we are um, a group of young engineers and we represent a sort of platform of dialogue between uh, young professionals and researchers that work in the field of uh, concrete and reinforced concrete structures. Uh, the idea is to create a network among us and, of course, uh, create a network uh, between uh, international people uh, and um, a bridge with the FIB, the International Federation for the Structural Concrete, uh, which um, is um, well known um, that produce uh, FIB bulletins and also the model code. So, uh, in this framework, we created this year the uh, CA, uh, the Concrete Affairs uh, Webinar Series, which is a collection of seminars that um, aims to disseminate knowledge uh, and the activities of Italian young researchers. And today, um, we are here just with uh, one of our brilliant researchers in uh, uh, talking about um, these beam column joints. If you want to know more about us or just to follow our activities, you can um, uh, connect with us with um, our social channels uh, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and also uh, consult our webpage um, where we update regularly our uh, events. And now uh, we come to the webinar of today. So the agenda uh, starts with uh, an overview about the experimental testing of these uh, reinforced column joints under, of course, seismic uh, loading. Then we have um, an overview of numerical modeling and also retrofitting strategies for such kind of um, elements. And then we will have the uh, question and answer session. So I ask all of you to um, write your questions in the chat, and then we will have a discussion all together at the end of the uh, presentation. So we will answer to all uh, your questions. The speaker of today is uh, Dr. Maria Teresa Di Risi. 
Uh, she's an assistant professor in structural engineer, uh, engineering at University of Naples, Federico II in Italy. And she's also actually a visiting researcher at University of Porto. And she's an expert in uh, experimental assessment, vulnerability analysis, and also retrofit of reinforced concrete, pol um, reinforced concrete structures, uh, focusing both on the structural and also non-structural components. So uh, thank you, Maria Teresa, for being here today with us and sharing your experience. And please, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Marta. So I'm going to share my screen. OK. Okay, perfect. So, um, thank you, Marta, for the presentation. And thank you um, thank to, to the FIB Young Italy uh, Young Member Groups uh, uh, for the opportunity to share with, uh, with you some of my research on reinforced joints today. Today, that is uh, Dante's days, and so I'd like to, to start this, uh, uh, this talk uh, remembering with this uh, well known citation from uh, Divina Commedia, that the dissemination commitment of this organization is very important since the necessity to share ideas and also uh, obviously research outcomes is part of human being. Uh, so um, let's start immediately with the first uh, um, basic, question, basic questions. So why dealing with unreinforced joints? Um, obviously, as you well know, uh, several countries worldwide and also in Europe uh, are characterized by a significant seismic hazard. And among these countries, uh, also Italy, obviously, uh, is uh, characterized by um, high seismicity, as you can see in this map. But actually, that hazard map was not always the same during time. And here you can see the evolution, for example, in the last uh, decades of this uh, hazard map. And you can see that uh, in the past, so um, um, there, are, there were a lot of, of sites that were considered as uh, not seismic prone sites, not seismic prone areas. And therefore structures there were designed to sustain basically gravity loads only. And um, in addition, uh, if we have a look to the um, reinforced concrete buildings in Italy, so here you can see that uh, uh, almost 80% uh, of, of these buildings uh, were realized before 1997. And 1997 is a very key, uh, key year, uh, I can say, for the uh, reinforced concrete buildings in Italy at least, because before uh, 1997, uh, joints were not designed at all and uh, steel wraps uh, were not located in a joint core. So we have um, reinforced concrete buildings uh, uh, without stirrups at all. And so when uh, the results of these two main problems uh, uh, is this one. So here we can see um, some examples of the damage to re reinforce the um, concrete joints in the last uh, um, very important, very famous uh, um, um, earthquakes from Italy, uh, the center Italy and L'Aquila with a sheer failure here of the joint panel until the uh, buckling of longitudinal rebars of columns uh, uh, due to the absence of stirrups in the joint core, <clears throat> as you can see here. But this problem is not a problem just of Italy, uh, but uh, I can say of all the uh, seismic prone areas all over the world. And so we uh, certainly need uh, a reliable way to assess their behavior under seismic uh, actions and uh, an effective way to, to strengthen uh, these uh, very important uh, uh, elements in reinforced concrete buildings. Uh, so uh, let's share some very basic concepts that will be helpful in the in the next for the next slides. Uh, first of all, here you can see that, uh, as you maybe already know, obviously uh, the joints can be classified depending on their positions in uh, uh, in the frame. And so, uh, for example, here you have, um, we, we, you can see uh, the typical example of the exterior joint. That is the generally the more vulnerable joint, and that is uh, the main core of this uh, concrete affair of this uh, of this talk. Uh, so um, we will analyze the, the response of exterior joints in presence of 
deformed bars and plane bars. And this is because plane bars uh, were very widespread in uh, reinforced concrete building stock before 70 for sure, at least in Italy, but not only in Italy because there are um, several other countries worldwide where um, the uh, plane bars were used uh, and were uh, very uh, widespread. And um, in particular for plane bars, for joint wheel plane bars, there are, a very, uh, there are very few tests, few studies from the literature. And in particular codes uh, does not, uh, do not play uh, particular attention to this kind of um, condition, to this kind of um, rebars. Um, Okay, um, you uh, well know uh, that the, the joint should sustain a significant shear load when uh, the, the frame uh, is subjected to seismic loading. And the shear loads, uh, shear load in joint that is uh, shown here, uh, basically depend on the tensile uh, force uh, due to the beam coming from the adjacent beam and um, is dependent on the shear load on column. Uh, so basically, let's imagine now that this blue curve represents the ductile behavior of the beam column subassemblage, and that uh, this Vy is the yielding point of the ductile behavior of the subassemblage. And uh, so, when the maximum joint shear strength uh, is lower than this yield point, uh, basically, we should expect to observe a shear failure of the panel. Uh, without the yielding of the, of the subassemblage. So in this case, we have the so-called J failure. On the contrary, when we um, have that the, the maximum, sorry, the maximum, uh, the strength of the joint is uh, higher than the yielding point, uh, we will observe the so-called BJ failure or CJ failure, depending on the, uh, on the weak uh, element between beam and column. Uh, and therefore, we will observe a shear failure of the joint panel after the yielding of the subassemblage. And um, what about codes? Uh, here you can see that uh, some current codes worldwide basically prescribed a safety check in terms of shear strength for our reinforced joints. Uh, here you can see some formulations from these codes uh, in European or American context. And basically, the joint shear strength is defined as dependent on uh, material properties of the concrete, obviously, uh, the dimensions of the joint, obviously, um, and some other parameters like, for example, the beam longitudinal reinforcement or the joint aspect ratio or rebar typologies um, are not considered, considered at all. So the first question we try to answer with the, the, the research activity I will show you in a while um, is uh, have this parameter an influence not only on the shear strength, but also on the full nonlinear behavior of the joint. So to answer this question, we started an experimental campaign that I'd like to, sh to, to, to divide in, um, in uh, three main steps. The first step uh, was about the analysis of um, are reinforced joints in presence of deformed bars. And we basically analyzed the effect of the uh, longitudinal reinforcement of the beam on the joint uh, response. Uh, actually, we realized the two identical specimen, specimens like this one without syrups with deformed bars that were anchored in the joint core, as you can see here, with a 90 degree anchorage. The two specimens were basically identical in the geometry and mechanical properties, except then uh, in the longitudinal reinforcement amount of the beam that was higher for test 1D uh, than uh, for test 2D. Um, so test 2D presented a lower amount of beam reinforcement. Um, here you can see the detail of the setup, the experimental setup we used uh, to test these two specimens, but not only. This uh, setup was used for all these specimens, uh, for all the tests we will, uh, we will analyze today together. And so um, basically the, the scheme that we realized with this setup at University of Naples in our lab uh, was uh, a statically determined uh, scheme with a hinge and a pin support at the end of the column and uh, um, with a free end at the end of the beam where we applied a cyclic uh, uh, displacement history by means of this hydraulic actuator uh, 
here you can see the displacement history. But a key point uh, that I'd like to, to highlight is that um, we used uh, these uh, instrumentations in the, on the joint core um, made up of linear potentiometers and LVDTs in order to measure experimentally the joint shear strain deformability contribution and also the deformability contribution due to the beam to column, beam to joint and column to joint uh, uh, rotation at the interfaces. So at the rotation at the interfaces. So here you can see uh, the first results. So um, here a fast video of the, of the typical behavior of one of these tests. And here the responses, the global responses in terms of beam load uh, drift, applied drift. Um, the test 1D, so the test where the longitudinal reinforcement amount of the beam uh, was uh, higher, um, reached a higher level of beam load, but uh, uh, that, uh, didn't reach the, the beam yielding. So this failure actually is a J failure mode. On the other hand, the test with the lower um, amount of longitudinal reinforcement exhibited a BJ failure mode. So the, the maximum beam load that was achieved during this test was lower than uh, test 1D, and, but higher than the beam yielding load. And so we observed here the yielding of the beam. Uh, this was the first main difference, but another difference at a local level uh, is shown here. Here we have the a comparison uh, between the two envelopes of the joint shear stress strain response uh, for the two tests. And we can see, uh, first of all, um, the uh, joint shear strain were experimentally measured and uh, calculated in such a way. But uh, above all, you can see that when the longitudinal reinforcement amount of the beam increases, the maximum strength, the maximum uh, joint shear stress, so the strength of the joint increases too. At, at a local level, we have also another important, uh, uh, important remark here, shown here. Uh, and basically, uh, the deformability contributions uh, um, we analyzed uh, uh, were uh, these three deformability contributions. So the deformability contribution due to the joint shear strain uh, the rotation uh, between beam and joint and the rotation between column and joint. And we can see that test which exhibited a J failure mode, so with the higher amount of longitudinal reinforcement, uh, had the um, highest contributions due, contribution due to the joint shear deformability with respect to the second test where the beam yielding was observed and so where the, uh, longi the, the the formability contribution due to the let's say fix and rotation between beam and joint uh, in dark gray here uh, was uh, the most important deformability contribution. Okay, so now let's move to step two uh, to analyze uh, um, the uh, effect on the joint response of the uh, typology of bars that uh, were present in beams and columns. So basically we compared these um, uh, deformed with plain bars uh, and plain bars uh, were anchored into the joint core with this uh, hook detail, as you can see here, and as typical in uh, existing buildings with plain bars. And so we compared the, these first tests, uh, first two tests that we already discussed before in step one, with the, these other two tests that, that were, uh, that were um, 1P and 2P um, um, reinforced with plain bars. And in particular, test 2D and 2P uh, were similar in terms of joint, joint shear stress at beam yielding. Uh, basically, uh, it was uh, impossible to use the same mechanical properties for this test because obviously plain bars have a different different mechanical properties, and in particular, a uh, lower uh, yield strength with respect to the formal parts. And so we realized that uh, um, um, a comparison between these this tests in terms of in terms of this parameter, that is the joint shear stress in correspondence to the beam yielding. Also in this case, test 1P uh, presented a higher longitudinal reinforcement amount of the beam with respect to test 2P. Here are the results in terms of global responses uh, uh, and the final damage state. Uh, uh, I'd like to show uh, in particular to highlight this uh, 
typical uh, detachment of the concrete wedge here that we can observe due to the push and pull action of the, of the hook of the plane bar. And here the comparisons in terms of global responses. Uh, actually, uh, the first two tests uh, uh, where the longitudinal reinforcement amount of the beam was uh, higher reached the highest uh, beam loads, uh, as you can see here. In both these cases, we have a J failure mode. For the other two tests, we observed a, a BJ failure mode. So we have the uh, yielding of the beam and we reached the lowest, lowest values, the lowest values of the, of the beam load and in particular slightly lower for tests with plane bars. Um, but an important difference between deformed and plane bars is shown here in terms of deformability contributions again. Uh, in particular also, we, if we um, analyze this, these two tests uh, with a J failure, you can see uh, that the uh, contribution of the fixed and the rotation at, 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 due to the beam this dark gray here is uh, um, most important for tests with plain bars with respect to tests with deformed bars. And this outcome is uh, even more true when we analyze the, the comparisons in terms of the, uh, of the, the two tests, 2D and 2P, so wh where we observe the yielding of the beam. And actually, uh, the after yielding, plain bars, as you know, uh, present a, a, a very poor uh, bond property uh, between concrete and steel. Okay, finally, let's move to the first step uh, of the uh, experimental campaign about the DS built specimens. Uh, in this uh, first test, we analyzed the effect, uh, uh, we analyzed the only test um, reinforced with plain bars. And we analyzed the, the effect of joint aspect ratio and beam longitudinal reinforcement amount on the response of joint. So basically, uh, joint aspect ratio is defined as the ratio between the beam eight and the column eight, as you can see here. And we uh, varied the joint aspect ratio from 1.43 to two. Um, so the response of these uh, two tests, the final damage state of this, uh, these four tests uh, is shown here and the global responses in terms of beam load applied drift here. Um, basically for all these tests, we never reached the yielding of the, of the sub-assemblage. So uh, the beam never reached, never reached his uh, yielding point. And so in uh, all these cases, we can say that the failure mode of the, of the joint was a J failure mode. Now, if we put all together the tests we performed on plain bars, on specimens reinforced with plain bars, uh, we can see here that uh, first of all, joint shear strain at the peak load is uh, um, dependent on the joint aspect ratio, and in particular, it increases when the joint aspect ratio increases. And about uh, joint strength, uh, here expressed in terms of maximum joint shear stress, we can see that uh, joint shear strength decreases if the joint aspect ratio increases and increases if the beam reinforcement amount increases. So basically these parameters, uh, at least the joint aspect ratio, beam reinforcement amount, but also the typology of bars should be uh, actually considered, should be taken into account in, in, uh, in the modeling phase, in the uh, numerical reproduction of this experimental data. And so now let's move to the modeling, to numerical modeling that we uh, used to reproduce these experimental responses. Uh, first of all, obviously the main point, uh, the key point of the, of the response of a joint uh, nonlinear behavior under seismic loading is its uh, strength. And in the literature, you can, found, you can find a lot of strength model, shear strength model for an reinforced joint that I tried to classify into the, these uh, three main groups, uh, as you can see here. But I, I'd like to, to draw your attention on the model proposed by Park and Mosalam that you can see here, because in this model, uh, the joint shear strength can be uh, reproduced 
uh, can be um, modeled as uh, um, due to two main resisting struts, two main contribution. The first contribution is due to the diagonal compressive strut that you can see here in red. And the second resisting contribution is due to the bond effect between the straight portion of the rebars anchored into the joint core and the surrounding concrete. Uh, so basically, according to this uh, model, the joint shear strength, in, strength increases if the joint aspect ratio decreases. And this is due to the fact that this, uh, uh, the inclination of this strut uh, changes depending on the joint aspect ratio. And um, additional, in addition, uh, the joint shear strength increases if beam longitudinal reinforcement amount increases. And this, you can see this behavior here. Um, K is a parameter from which the, uh, you can define the joint shear strength. So K increases when this parameter increases. And these parameters, that is the joint shear index, uh, basically depends on the beam longitudinal reinforcement amount. So keeping this in mind, you can easily understand that obviously when we uh, pass from the formal bars, because this model is related to the formal bars, to plane bars, we should expect a lower uh, joint shear strength because basically the, this second mechanism, resisting mechanism, the, the ST2, the bond effect is lower in presence of plane bars. And so if we try to uh, schematically represent the joint shear strength here, depending on the strain demand in longitudinal reinforcement, we should expect that plane bars uh, present, uh, as, you, uh, as you can see here, a lower joint shear strength, lower joint shear strength values. Mm -hmm. um, in both cases, plane and deformed parts, when the strain demand at the yielding, when the strain, the yielding strain is overcome, overcame, um, obviously the joint shear strength should decrease due to the uh, deterioration in the bond properties. So we tried to, um, to define quantitatively uh, this uh, um, strength for joint with plane bars in particular. And to do so, to do so we um, collected an experimental database from, uh, from the literature, including our tests that we discussed before. Uh, we uh, realized a, um, a collection of tests, a homogeneous collection of tests with uh, quite low values of concrete compressive strength as typical in, in existing buildings. And uh, here you can see also that uh, typically uh, the, the information about the experimentally measured the joint shear strain was not uh, published or was not available, available in, in the literature. Um, on the contrary, this information was very important in the, in the modeling phase for our proposals as I will show you in a while. Okay, um, so um, here you can see the trend of joint shear strength uh, from the database we collected, depending on the joint aspect ratio that basically is the um, inclination of this diagonal and on the beam longitudinal reinforcement. Uh, the, uh, here these trends uh, confirm the trend we, try, we, we, we already found for our, for our uh, tests. Um, when we applied the uh, strength model, the models that were calibrated for, um, unrein for, for um, unreinforced joints with the formal bars, we found that these models uh, basically overestimate the joint shear strength in presence of plane bars, uh, except then for this, this model that was proposed uh, for, uh, uh, based on tests with plane bars that produces a, a slightly uh, underestimation of the, of the experimental results. So we proposed a modification, a new um, shear strength model for, the, for the, this kind of joints, where basically you can see here that the maximum joint shear strength depends on the parameter theta, that is uh, uh, the joint aspect ratio. So it depends on the joint aspect ratio um, of the joint and depends also on uh, this parameter that is uh, the uh, yield the, 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 the joint stress in uh, correspondence to the yielding of the beam. So this parameter represents the dependence of the joint shear strength with the beam longitudinal reinforcement amount. Um, 
the results was quite good with respect to experimental, on average, at least with respect to the experimental data. Um, so what about the wound nonlinear response of the joint? So obviously the, the, the peak load, the, the, the strength of the joint is one characteristic point of, the, of its response under seismic loading. Uh, but um, we, uh, we, um, we would to, to model the wool nonlinear response of the, of the joint. And so we uh, can have some several options from the literature, from the finite element need or the finite element analysis so to uh, the use of multi springs approach or single spring like this one. Uh, here, so you can see some proposals from the literature. The proposal we used is this one. So basically our numerical modeling was quite simple, I can say, and also suitable for a, a higher number of nonlinear analysis. And uh, uh, we used some rigid links into the joint region and a lumped rotational spring here, which represent the joint panel response and some um, rotational springs at the interfaces between beams, columns, and joint, which represent the uh, fixed and rotation contribution. Uh, so the first step of our modeling proposal was for the format bar first, uh, the collection of tests from the literature where the joint shear strain was experimentally measured. And so based on this data, we propose this quadrilinear response of the envelope of the joint response in terms of joint shear stress strain. And then uh, you can easily pass from the joint shear stress to the uh, joint moment, which characterize, the characterizes this uh, spring depending on um, some equilibrium equations. And so uh, through this uh, formulation, basically. So here you can see the average behavior in, uh, um, for, the, for the joint uh, envelope, the, respond, the envelope of its re response. And um, similarly, based on empirical data, uh, on, on collected, uh, collected data, we also calibrated the, the uh, hysteretic response of the joint panel by means basically of the pinching for axial material in open seas uh, that is uh, represented here. And so we calibrated the parameters of this material which um, on which uh, depend uh, the, the the pinching for the pinching depend the pinching effect the um, the strength uh, the strength degradation and the stiffness and reloading stiffness degradation unloading and reloading stiffness degradation. Um, okay, basically we did the same also for plane bars for joints reinforced with plane bars. In this case, we only have our tests because uh, in our tests we experimentally measured the joint shear deformability and so here you can see the comparison between uh, the average response of the quadrilinear response of the joint panel for plane and for deformed bars and basically you can see here that the shape is not so different uh, the the strength here is normalized obviously the shape of, the, of this response is not uh, uh, so different. The plane bars presented a quite high deformability, higher deformability at the peak load. But basically the, the very important difference between plane and the formant is the joint shear strength, as we discussed before. And obviously, as you all expect, the fixed and rotation contribution. So, the fixed and rotation contribution can be uh, included together with the, from the flexural deformability contribution into a single hinge at the interfaces. And so we have to choose a proper model uh, for that hinge depending on the bar typology. Otherwise, uh, you can mechanically model the, the, the fixed and rotation contribution depending on, on the bars. And so when we did so, uh, for plane bars in particular, we, um, we model the, uh, this uh, hook ended plane bar as a series of springs, as you can see here. The first spring represents the hook contribution and the other springs uh, represent the bond strength contribution. Uh, so the bond uh, between steel and concrete. 
in the literature, there are some proposals for this, uh, for this uh, relationship, bond strength sleep relationship. Obviously, um, the, the maximum bond strength predicted for plain bars is always lower than for deformed bars. And uh, we used, uh, among these proposals, we used the proposal by Verderam et al. Uh, here you can see the envelope of that proposals, but uh, uh, also the cyclic, uh, the hysteretic uh, proposal is uh, available for this model. So uh, we, uh, at the end, um, made a validation of our numerical proposal, and the validation phase was performed at different levels. The first level of validation was at the, at the subassemblage level, so the, the, the easiest way to, to validate our model. So we select, uh, selected the, some tests from the literature, like this one, like uh, the tests we tested in, uh, in, in our lab, and we compared the numerical responses and experimental responses, as you can see here, for some examples in presence of deformed bars or with the, for specimens with plain bars. Um, a second level of validations was performed at a frame level. So basically, we um, model the behavior, for example, of this frame that is a one bay, one story reinforced concrete frames designed, frame designed for gravity loads uh, only without syrups in, uh, in the joint, uh, reinforced with deformed bars and tested in our lab with a pseudostatic, pseudostatic cyclic loadings um, with the, the setup shown here. At the end of this test, the joint was particularly damaged. Here you can see some pictures of the final damage states and the evolution and the final damage state of the, of the unreinforced joints of this frame. And basically, uh, we reproduce the experimental uh, response of this frame uh, in a, with a, a model, including our proposal from, uh, for, for the joint. And uh, in, in such a way, we um, succeeded in, uh, in the reproduction with, the, with an hour numerical model of the softening phase of the experimental response of this, uh, of this test. Another validation at a frame level was performed uh, um, this time for plain bars uh, by using the results of this well-known test from the literature that was tested, tested at University of Pavia by Calvi et al. And that was uh, um, reinforced with plain bars. Uh, so in this time we um, have reproduced the envelope of the response uh, um, of, the, of, this, uh, um, of this frame but also the uh, hysteretic behavior um, quite well. Um, but above all, we reproduced uh, uh, actually the real damage we observed uh, um, in, uh, in the joints in particular at the first floor. So the model was able to catch the real damage observed during the test. And uh, to conclude the numerical modeling phase, I'd like to show you just an application of our model. Uh, so we applied the model to this frame that was a, a free bay for story frame uh, designed for gravity loads only, also in this case, and reinforced with the formal bars. Uh, we modeled this uh, frame in such a way, so in a lamped plasticity approach, basically by using our joint model. And we um, analyzed it uh, by means of 50 records in a, an IDA approach, an incremental dynamic analysis approach, in two hypotheses the hypothesis of rigid joints and the hypothesis of nonlinear joints, where nonlinear means that we used our uh, model for joints. So uh, when we um, analyzed uh, this, uh, this frame, uh, we also uh, produced these cur fragility curves uh, that you can see here. These fragility curves were defined at different damage states uh, defined from slide to complete uh, according to definition by Hadzus. And you can see that uh, in particularly, particularly at uh, the extensive damage state uh, that can be considered as a, as a sort of life, safe, life safety limit state, the median capacity of the frame with the, um, with the nonlinear joint, that is uh, this curve, has a, um, 
a capacity that is uh, significantly lower than the corresponding frame with rigid joint, that is this dashed curve. So the uh, median capacity of the case of rigid joints was more than double than the median capacity of the nonlinear response of the joint. And so uh, what does it mean? Uh, this is uh, how much we can gain uh, if we uh, in, um, retrofit this building, this, this frame in particular, uh, by using the, by strengthen our, our reinforced joints. And so uh, obviously the strengthening uh, of joints can be particularly important in existing reinforced concrete buildings. Um, there are several techniques from the literature, as you know, uh, here I try to, to collect some examples of the possible strengthening techniques we, um, we have in the literature. And in particular, we will focus the, on these two uh, techniques. So the use of FRP materials for the, the uh, wrapping of joint and the use of pre-stressed steel strips to strengthen joint. Because these two, um, we, we experimentally tested these uh, two uh, solutions. So let's start, um, let's start from the, the FRP wrapping, the use of FRP materials. And as you know, in the literature, there are uh, several tests uh, that prove the effectiveness of the use uh, of using uh, FRP materials for um, the strengthening of joint. But actually, uh, very few of them, as you can see here, uh, were aimed at minimizing the level of disruption. So basically, we focused our attention uh, just on, on, this, uh, on this main name. So we wanted to use FRP wrapping, but we wanted also to limit the level of disruption of this intervention. That means limit the building done time uh, due to the intervention, obviously. And so we tested some specimens uh, uh, like this one. Here we can see the uh, reference specimens uh, that was uh, realized uh, obviously without stirrups in the joint core and which exhibited a BJ failure mode uh, and was uh, reinforced with uh, deformed bars. So um, we uh, designed two uh, possible um, strategies uh, to use FRP materials to strengthen this joint. This joint. Uh, the first strategy was uh, a low impact strategy. So basically, we used um, a um, one layer of quadriaxial CFRP fabric on the joint that was extended uh, at, the, uh, at the ends of the beams at the hand court by means of uniaxial CFRP wraps applied in such a way. So these are, these are the um, uniaxial CFRP uh, wraps. The second solution that is a, a sort of, uh, I, I called it uh, near zero impact, uh, because this solution can be applied fully from the exterior, uh, was realized by means of a one layer of quadriaxial uh, CFRP material, CFRP fabric, uh, that was grouted to the, um, to the concrete uh, surface and fixed uh, by means of five strips of uh, steel FRP uniaxial fabric. These strips uh, were grouted uh, to the into, into drilled uh, holes, and basically they uh, worked as nails for the uh, for the quadriaxial uh, fabric uh, below. Okay, uh, the design of this uh, strengthening intervention, in the particular, the definition of the number of quadriaxial CFRP layers we need. Uh, was performed in agreement with the FIB Bulletin 90 prescriptions based on the work by Del Vecchio et al. And it was a force-based design that uh, aimed at reach the beam flexural strength of this, uh, of this specimen. Not only beam yielding, but beam flexural strength. So here you can see the results. And in particular, the, the comparisons of the envelopes in terms of beam load applied drift here. Um, in particular, the, the low impact solution, that is this one, um, succeed in uh, reaching the beam flexural capacity. And actually the increment of the, uh, in terms of strength was uh, uh, about 50%. At uh, a 3% drift, when the drift applied was a 3%, uh, 
uh, we observed the, the uh, rupture of the FRP, uh, basically due to the high uh, strain demand at the interface between the beam and the joint, obviously. Uh, in the second case, in the case of the near impact, uh, the near zero impact solution, the failure mode was due to the FRP debonding after the fracture of these uh, um, anchors, of the steel FRP anchors we used. So um, we succeed in increase uh, um, the uh, uh, bit, uh, the um, beam load, uh, the maximum beam load. We also succeed in uh, increasing the uh, dissipated energy by means of these uh, strengthening techniques. Uh, we we uh, have to improve a little bit uh, the, the uh, anchorage system, obviously, and we are working on that. Uh, here you can see another important thing, uh, obviously, that is that these solutions can, uh, um, can be considered as a local interventions, local retrofit interventions, because actually the initial tangent stiffness does not change at all, as we expected when we, when we use this kind of materials, this kind of strengthening. So finally, uh, the last uh, uh, strengthening technique I'd like to, to show you is uh, based on the use of pre-stressed steel strips in, uh, in the joint core. So only in the joint core. Uh, actually, we used uh, these steel strips. They were pre-stressed and put in, uh, in this position. Here you can see a 3D view of the intervention by means of the, uh, not only steel strips, but also L-shaped and whole Called uh, steel uh, plates. And uh, basically, these strips provided an active confinement to the joint core um, and then also a tensile contribution. Uh, so, like some uh, exterior steel uh, I can say. Here you can see the side view of the intervention and then the plan view. Um, in, uh, in the plan view, you can see that uh, also in this case, we use two configurations of the, uh, for, the, for the intervention. The first one was a low impact intervention, um, the so-called CAM1. And in this low impact intervention, we basically realized two holes in the, the two beams, and we realized a, a closed rectangle with the, the pre-stressed steel strips. In the second case, in the near zero impact, uh, we used, uh, we realized uh, uh, a closed triangle. This is the solution called CAM2. And this is a solution that can be applied fully from the exterior. So um, similar to the uh, previous solution with FRT material. In this case, we realized uh, some holes that were uh, inclined um, with uh, 40, 45 degrees with uh, respect to the horizontal. Okay, uh, now, how uh, we have designed the, the number of strips we, that, that were required. Uh, basically, when, we had to, when, when you had to, to design this kind of interventions, the, you can use uh, two approaches. The first approach is the, the pre-cracking approach. So basically, in this approach, you can think that the pre-stressed strips provided an active confinement to, to, to the joint core. So they produce this lateral pressure that is able to shift the Morse circle uh, of, the, of a, a member within the joint core, as you can see here. And so basically uh, we can use uh, a formulation that is uh, quite similar to uh, one of the two formulations proposed in the, in the current code for stirrups, but using here the pretension stress instead of the yielding strength. And this is the first approach. The second approach, uh, uh, is a post-cracking approach. So basically, in this case, the strips um, worked, work as uh, um, exterior stirrups. And so you can uh, dimension the intervention, you can define the number of strips you, re you require uh, by means of this equation that is uh, very similar to equation you use in current codes to define the number of stirrups required in the joint. The minimum amount of strips uh, that are coming from these two formulations is uh, this one. So we put uh, three layers of strips, uh, as you can see here, with five strips each. Uh, 
Okay, let's see now the results of this test. Um, these are fast videos. Uh, in, uh, in particular, the first video is the test without syrups. This is the as built condition. The second case here in the center is the case where uh, we put the, in, the, in the joint core a number of stirrups that was designed according to the current code. So this was uh, the, uh, the uh, current seismic design. And finally, at the end, we have here the uh, pre-stressed strips in the configuration CAM1. So at the end, you can see that uh, the reinforced joint is totally destroyed, basically. Uh, the, uh, we all can see here the, co the complete concrete crashing in the joint core. Um, on the other hand, you have here the situation of the code-based T-wraps where the, the joint core is just slightly cracked. And we, uh, you can see here a, a wonderful plastic hinge in the beam. And similarly uh, to this situation, uh, we can uh, observe also this situation, CAM1. Chem, chem so CAM1 behaves, be, the behavior of CAM1 was very similar to the behavior of the test with the steel wraps from the code. Um, okay, uh, now you can see here the global responses of all these tests, and in particular also the test CAM2 that was missing in the videos. Um, in CAM2, you can see here the final damage state. So at the end of this test, we observed that the joint core was, uh, the, the concrete in the joint core was, uh, was crushed. Um, so CAM2, um, the behavior of CAM2 was not so effective as uh, CAM1. But if we compare the envelopes of the global responses, uh, you can see that also CAM2 uh, presented uh, an improvement with respect to the test without syrups, that is in red, an improvement in terms of ductility capacity. And obviously the higher ductility was obtained at the end by means of the solution CAM1, because solution CAM1 uh, was very close to the, uh, to, to a, a new uh, realized, a new uh, building, a new realized uh, um, joint with syrups. Uh, this uh, uh, effect, this uh, hierarchy between this, the tests is confirmed also in terms of dissipated energy, you can see uh, here. But a very important thing can be shown uh, by, this, uh, by this plot, because in this plot you uh, have the envelopes of the joint shear stress strain response. And basically the test with the steel wraps from codes in black and the test CAM1 um, basically in these two tests, the joint unloads after reaching its peak. So this is a very important issue because this means that actually the damage is not concentrated in the joint, in the joint panel, but as we saw before in the, in the fast videos, the damage was concentrated at the end of the beam. And so the, the behavior of the subassemblage is more ductile. Finally, uh, to conclude, um, I just like to say that being column joints uh, without syrups uh, still deserves uh, further attention because we need uh, reliable numerical modeling and we need uh, effective strengthening strategies. About numerical modeling, there are some uh, other open uh, issues um, for sure. And so we need maybe some uh, other experimental testing above all for tests reinforced with plane bars. And about strengthening, te strengthening techniques, uh, we need strengthening techniques uh, um, that should be effective, obviously, but also with a low impact on the building on time, because this is the only way to, uh, to make these interventions widespread on the wool reinforced concrete building stock, and so to reduce the vulnerability of the wool um, reinforced concrete building stock. Okay, uh, at the end, um, here just uh, you can find some uh, references uh, if you want to uh, more details about what we discussed uh, today. And finally, let me acknowledge the, all the colleagues uh, involved in this uh, research, the experimental activities and the laboratory staff, above all engineer Campanella, uh, who was the soul of, the, of our lab. And finally, thank you all for your kind attention.
thank you, Maria Teresa. Thank you for this really interesting presentation. Um, and uh, from all the people uh, here today, um, please, if you have any kind of question or curiosity uh, to ask to Maria Teresa, then you can write in the chat. And while we wait for people uh, to ask their questions, I can start uh, with some curiosity about uh, what you showed us. And in particular, mm, okay, so we have already the first question. Please, Angelo, can you, you can write the question in the chat, please. Uh, so my question is about the uh, this kind of retrofit solution that you showed, uh, because of course you um, have an experience that is related to the experimental practice. So you have seen which is the potential, the benefit from an experimental point of view in the lab. Uh, in your opinion, from a technical point of view in the field, uh, which are the potential and also the limitation of all these techniques that you analyzed uh, when you uh, want to make them in practice in a, on a real existing structure? Uh, so thank you for, for the question, Marta. And obviously each uh, strengthening technique uh, has some benefits, but also some weak points, I can say. Uh, some weak points uh, um, in particular, um, the, the weak points will guide the design and the choice of uh, one strengthening technique or another obviously depending on the situation. Uh, for example, if I think at the solution, uh, the CAM solution, so the use of pre-stressed steel strips as uh, we, uh, we saw um, before, um, this solution can, has actually uh, currently uh, some uh, technological limitations in, in the number of strips, for example. And so, um, if we have the case of uh, beams uh, in which the longitudinal reinforcement amount is very high, we should expect that the performance of the uh, application of pre-stressed steel strips uh, would work not so well. So we have to um, consider also the technological aspects, uh, obviously, uh, for each uh, technique. Also for FRP materials, so obviously, uh, I. I told you before that actually we have to improve some details if we want to apply uh, FRP materials fully from the exterior in particular, as we tested in our lab, uh, we have to necessarily investigate it more about the anchorage system that we have to use to uh, have a, a low impact solution, but effective, obviously. Okay, thank you uh, for your answer. And we have uh, some questions in the chat, so I will read them for you um, from Angelo Marchisella. Uh, so the first one, was the axial force in the column effectively included in the spring formulation uh, that you use for modeling the beam column joints? Um, okay, uh, the, um, uh, the axial load, not in experimental testing, uh, you want to know in, uh, in the modeling. modeling. So, Okay, uh, so basically we use the axial load um, coming from the, the upper column. So basically this was the, the axial load level uh, that was keep constant uh, during the test, um, especially when we use a plastic, a lumped plasticity approach. So as uh, common for lumped plasticity approach, it was, uh, it was the same. And it was uh, the, the axial load coming from the upper column. Perfect, okay. And the second one is about the, the validation experimental, oh, I'm sorry, the numerical model. So the match with, uh, with respect to uh, Calvi uh, uh, pinching and your numerical model was not uh, perfect, in particular re uh, reload, re reloading path. Could you please discuss further? Maybe I don't yes, know. yes, actually, uh, that's a good point. And thank you for the question. Uh, actually, we used the, in, uh, in that case, we used uh, the, the joint model we, because we wanted to uh, reproduce basically mainly the damage that we observed, uh, they observed in, in their test to, to joints. Uh, but obviously the hysteretic response is uh, more complex and uh, we used uh, um, a lumped plasticity approach model coupled with our joint model. 
So we have basically two um, empirical models used for joints and for beams and columns, and we apply them um, as just a, as an application actually. And uh, the results, as uh, um, the um, I, I don't remember the name of the uh, the guy who did this question. The, the answer, the, the numerical answer, um, was not so was not perfect, especially in terms of pinching. Actually, so we have to improve for sure this uh, uh, this uh, comparison by investigating um, um, about this uh, this point about this key issue. Thank you. Okay, we have another question always from the same author. So is redundancy in frames mitigating the weakness you uh, issue in joint fragility? Uh, sorry, sorry, Marta, can you repeat, please? Uh, is redundancy in frames mitigating the weakness uh, you issue in joint fragility? I don't know what exactly he means with redundancy uh, in terms of... Mm, Maybe the use of some strengthening techniques that can can uh, be used for um, for a multiple purpose aim, maybe for multiple purpose uh, strengthening. And so, in this case, obviously, it, I think it depends case by case. Uh, I think it, it's not easy to provide an answer, uh, a clear answer that can be uh, general valid for for all the. Mr. Risi, uh, I am Angelo Marchisella, the author of the past three uh, questions. Thank you for your answer for number one. Thank you for your answer for number two. Let me just clarify my third question. My third question is, uh, uh, since we have um, different joints, and for instance, if you think Calvi, Calvi has two bay, four stories, and uh, would it be um, a redundancy, for instance, if you think about redistributions um, in terms of uh, failure of one joint, probably the exterior one, and force transfer from the, 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 the exterior part of the frame to the interior part, which is, by the way, uh, less loaded. Would it be this effect in terms of redundancy? And redundancy, by the way, in this case, means static redundancy. So having a, a redundant structure uh, in the sense that it can be possible to redistribute forces, in this case, laterally uh, based. And I'm just saying that uh, we are, we are, we have seen um, um, some uh, residual capacity in in your exterior joint experiment. At least, uh, having uh, stopped the, the the your test at the level of joint uh, of, of the drift ratio, which is six percent, which is quite huge in terms of re on re -averting. So I'm just I was just wondering if redundancy can be also um, a, 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 a good strategy also in, in structural analysis to assess uh, really the behavior of a frame structure rather, uh, rather than uh, assessing the fragility of the joint at the level of the sum assemble. Uh, yes, um, okay. I, I now I understand your question. Thank you Thanks. for clarifying it. And I totally agree with you. So basically the, the level of the subassembly suggests the, the simplest way to investigate about that problem, to analyze the response of the joint, obviously. But uh, when we um, model the joint within a frame, within a wood frame or building, Obviously, the redundancy, as you you told us, uh, is a, a very important point to take into account. But uh, also in this case, uh, so this is the case I can say of the application I showed you, for example, for that frame, uh, the frame for which we obtained, we observed uh, to, uh, today together the uh, fragility curves. So also in case uh, um, we considered redundancy, uh, actually, uh, there are some cases, some structures, some frames, depending on their features, that can be particularly 
uh, in which joints can be particularly problematic. So we, in, we have to select uh, in a proper way the, the way of intervention and also the joints where we have to, uh, to that, that we have to strengthen. Right, okay, thanks. Thank thanks. You. Okay, thank you, Angela. Uh, and now we have another couple of questions from uh, Riccardo Nitissi, uh, in, always in the chat. So the first one is, did you propose a numerical model also for strengthened joints? Uh, actually, not yet. Uh, it's a good point, and it's a point uh, uh, we, we are working on that. On that. Um, above all about uh, the proposal, first of some, um, I can say, design tools for this, uh, in terms of strength first, for these uh, strengthening strategies, uh, above all for pre-stressed steel strips, and then also for numerical modeling. The, the, I think it's a very important point. It's a, it's a key issue, especially for modeling the, uh, the, the effectiveness or in a realistic way, the effectiveness of the intervention. So thank you for your question. It's a very good point. And we are working on that. For, for future work, so for future development. Okay, the second question is, uh, what kind of approach do you use to calibrate the aesthetic parameters in the pinching for material in open feed? So uh, basically in, uh, in uh, this calibration, we, uh, we used the pinching for materials and we, uh, as you maybe know, the pinching for material is defined by a set of parameters, uh, a lot of parameters, uh, defining the pinching effect, uh, the, uh, the reloading and unloading stiffness degradation, the force degradation and so on. So um, we, assumed that the force degradation was uh, uh, does the not does not exist in in our cases because actually our envelopes were already degraded in terms of strength and we calibrated the remaining parameters starting from the pinching parameters and then the other parameters um, in order to minimize the dissipated energy between the numerical uh, model the numerical results and the experimental results. So we calculated the um, in iteratively with a, um, an algorithm the um, energy dissipation in for the numerical results and for the experimental results, and we minimize this the difference in order to obtain finally the the final set of parameters we used. And uh, I showed you in the, in the in these slides, just the mean values of these uh, parameters. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions uh, in the chat, I think we can also uh, um, close, and maybe we can wait. Okay, we, there is another question uh, from Giuseppe Ferrara. So thank you, Maria Teresa, for the interesting presentation. So you mentioned the importance of focusing on external joints because weaker. Uh, with respect to the entire building structural behavior, do you think it is needed to focus on internal joints too? And if yes, do you think the low impact retrofitting solutions uh, you showed may be applied on internal joints? Uh, do you think these aspects should be deeper investigated? Uh, absolutely, yes. So uh, obviously, thank you for your question, Giuseppe. Obviously, uh, the, um, uh, the exterior joints uh, are the most vulnerable kind of joint, um, but uh, uh, also interior joints should be uh, studied similarly and uh, are um, also studied a lot in the literature, actually. Um, we have to, um, we can, uh, strengthen also interior joints and also with this low uh, impact solution, I think. So just uh, extrapolating what we, done, we have done for exterior joints, I think that this kind of solutions um, can be applied also to, uh, to interior joints. Um, for sure, for what concern, for what concern the, the low impact solution, not necessarily the near zero impact solution between the solutions we 
uh, we analyzed, we discussed it before. But for sure, the low impact solution can be uh, certainly applied also and should be uh, in many cases applied also to interior joints. Okay, we have another question in the chat from Bibek uh, uh, Manandar. Uh, thank you for your uh, for the excellent presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, my question um, may be a bit out of the line. Uh, although we are talking about joint strengthening mainly, I wanted to ask if there can be any tweaks for column strengthening as well. Uh, I saw that the intervention uh, were well able to form beautiful plastic hinges in the beams, preventing joint concrete crushing, but columns could be the next in line to softer causing pancake failure. In Nepal, we saw a lot of cases uh, in the 2015 earthquake. Um, okay. So could there be a way to strengthen the columns at least up to some length from the joint using the same methods uh, like pre-stressing or CAM? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, actually, uh, the use of pre-stressed steel, steel uh, um, I think is most common for uh, the retrofit of columns than for joints. Uh, especially in the experimental testing you can find in the literature. So uh, for sure, the columns can be the next weakest element of the chain. And so um, in a structural analysis, you can be able to, to know, to catch if the columns should be uh, strengthening or not. And in, that, in this case, uh, if yes, you can use prestressed steel also for, for, uh, for columns. So you can uh, increase both ductility, but also strength, uh, shear strength for, for columns. Uh, so mm, this intervention can be, can be certainly applied also to, also to columns. Perfect, okay. So I think there are no more questions in the chat. Uh, there is a comment from Simone Spagnolo. Uh, thank you about the interesting presentation and the work, good work done. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we can uh, close here the webinar. So thank you very much, Maria Teresa, for staying with us and sharing your work and explaining and answering to all these interesting questions. And thanks also to the audience for the interesting questions. And um, have a nice evening uh, and see you soon. Stay safe and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Master. Bye bye. Bye.